Greetings, my name is Karen Kirkhart. I identify as a white cisgendered heterosexual female elder of German heritage. I grew up in a working class community in Southern California and my schooling was steeped in a romanticized history of the California missions. I now reside in Syracuse, New York on the land of the Haudenosaunee. My valued co-author and colleague, Nadia Brantley, is unable to attend the conference this year due to the responsibilities of her new position as acting director of the baccalaureate program in the School of Social Work. We're excited to share some ideas from our journey exploring this year's conference theme. Mindful of time restrictions, we'll try to convey succinctly, first, why interrogation is an important element of evaluation praxis. Secondly, how we're defining and distinguishing two frames, white supremacy and settler coloniality. Third, illustrative applications of these frames with three core elements of CRE. And finally, closing reflections on this work. Three traditions place interrogation firmly within the context of evaluation praxis, inclusive of, but not restricted to CRE. First is the tradition of self-reflection. Here we highlight the work of Simonet, who theorizes self-work required of evaluators to interrogate their own understandings, positions, and sensibilities as a necessary starting point. With respect to CRE, commitment to reflexive scrutiny was embedded in its earliest conceptualization, which is the second foundation. Hood underscored evaluation's responsibility to portray communities of color accurately and reflect, respectively, ref, respectfully reflecting on our underlying assumptions and also our limitations in doing so. Third, interrogation is conceptually congruent with Scriven's idea of meta-evaluation, evaluating the evaluation, which he characterizes as the conscience of evaluation. Yarborough, Shula, Hobson, and Carruthers formalized meta-evaluation in three accountability standards in the third edition of the program evaluation standards, making explicit that such reflection is a necessary component of quality evaluation. Essentially, we're asking what could go wrong? Specifically, how might an evaluation model intended to promote equity and inclusion inadvertently support white supremacy and settler colonialism? First, some definitions and distinctions. Most of us in the Korea community who are white are aware of the privilege afforded by our appearance and to varying degrees, we acknowledge that privilege, that privilege as instrumental in our personal or professional success. White supremacy is quite another matter. It reveals structures of white power in which we all participate, structures of domination and dehumanization, but with which we don't identify. White supremacy is brutal and violent, and coming to terms with this challenges the innocence of whiteness, as Leonardo says. While I may not recognize myself in this frame, my complicity is there nonetheless through participation in structures of white supremacy surrounding evaluators' practice. Coloniality addresses longstanding patterns of power emerging from political and economic relations of colonialism. Maldonado Torres distinguishes between coloniality and colonialism, the former being the lasting structures created by the imperial empires of the latter. Coloniality survives colonialism. Coloniality names domination focused on exploitation, not extermination. Settler occupation may not be permanent, but the structures of domination survive. Settler coloniality is distinctly different. It operates through removal, disappearance, replacement, or extermination of persons indigenous to a territory in order to create a new society. 
occupation of, set by ter of territory by settlers is permanent. Bonds and Inwood note that settler coloniality should not be construed as a moment in history, but as an enduring structure requiring constant maintenance. Both white supremacy and settler coloniality are, in the words of Morganson, right here, right now. White supremacy and settler coloniality are intertwined concepts as portrayed in this simple diagram. Certainly this isn't the only representation. For example, this figure communicates the inseparability of the two constructs, but captures none of the intersectional complexities. But it does serve to remind us that each concept feeds the other. We center this interrogation of CRE in the context of its origin in the US. However, we're by no means experts in settler colonialism. In fact, much of the rich theorizing on this topic has been done in Australia and Canada. Hickson, whose <clears throat> book is portrayed here, the cover, provides a well-detailed, meticulously referenced description of our violent history in the United States. This is not an easy read. For me, there was a visceral reaction of nausea and revulsion, but I came away with a deeper understanding of the violence of white supremacy and settler coloniality in the US. CRE was created to reconsider stakes responsive evaluation in the context of culturally responsive pedagogy and assessment. All of these systems, education, assessment, evaluation, function within the broader US structures of white supremacy and settler colonialism. Therefore, CRE cannot claim a state of grace. It must acknowledge and manage inherent contradictions and complexities. Consider three examples. <clears throat> History. CRE, grounded in the early work of African-American scholars, respects history of persons and place as foundations of understanding. However, it's important that white supremacy and settler coloniality not be relegated to the past. They must be historicized, but not positioned as historical. Moreover, one must recognize the existence of multiple histories, the accounts themselves having been shaped by colonialism. One of the most pernicious myths in Hawaiian history is that the Kanaka Maoli passively accepted the erosion of their culture and the loss of their nation. The myth of non-resistance was created in part because mainstream historians avoided and omitted the wealth of material written in Hawaiian. Similarly, oral histories passed down through generations of African-Americans have been erased from white versions of history, which may be more easily digestible. The second example, reciprocity. In the context of CRE, reciprocity is seen in terms of benefits returned to community. It's a good thing. However, harm can also be reciprocal. When relationships are inherently unequal, and damage, harm, pain have been inflicted, responding in kind perpetuates suspicion, retaliation, and often violent retribution. Hickson's account of US settler colonialism repeatedly references boomeranging violence, and such accounts are similarly visible today in the evening news. Finally, the third example is relationship. Trustworthy relationships are fundamental to the validity of CRE. However, the dynamics of relationships are complex and trust may be hard won but easily violated. In 2005, Hood, Hobson and Frierson characterized inclusion as a mandate for CRE. However, inclusion is not the agenda of indigenous persons who seek independent recognition rather than being retrofitted into an existing structure. Inclusion integrates people into settler systems whereby they simultaneously participate in an indigenous 
dispossession and erasure. The dynamics of inclusion can come precariously close to those of assimilation, which leads to disappearance, invisibility, and cultural genocide. This should be a caution not only for CRE, but for all collaborative and participatory models. Garancini speaks to the importance of avoiding participation as coercive assimilation. And you may recall Sandy Grandy's plenary address at CREA last year at this time, which addressed refusal as relationship. Good intentions do not exempt us from complicity. This work requires both vigilance and humility. In closing, we underscore the importance of interrogating the frameworks themselves. We've chosen two specific frameworks here. However, each of these may be reflexively critiqued for their strengths and limitations. We propose this not as a one-off academic project, but as a recursive exercise of critical reflection as part of practice. Praxis. More often, moreover, because any given frame both reveals and conceals, using multiple frames is important in probing the boundaries of our understandings. For example, McKay and colleagues use race rather than white supremacy. Wilkerson uses caste rather than race. Barker uses imperialism as opposed to settler coloniality. Each of these nuances may increase the clarity of some insights and complicate or obscure others. Finally, these interrogations could be also extended to other core elements of CRE, boosting critical reflection. We include all references cited visually or orally in the spirit of transparency crediting ownership of ideas and encouraging further learning and dialogue. I click through them so that this information is recorded. I look forward to hearing your reactions, ideas, and questions during today's live Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kirkhart for providing the recording of your presentation. Um, I'm sure there are many thoughts churning and questions. And so we are going to save those and we are now going to turn it over um, to Leanne and Eleanor for their presentation. And then again, as I said, we will open it up for dialogue. Hi everyone, just checking Alicia, you're gonna play it, right? Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Leanne Calamine. I'm a faculty member at Loyola University Chicago and a colleague Eleanor Titmull and I are going to um, share with you our working paper on justice and evaluation. So evaluation scholars have made many key arguments for the role of values and value judgments in evaluation, such as Jennifer Green, House and House, Griffin, and Schwant. And although values are integral in evaluation practice, for the purpose of this paper, we focus on how values shape the moral end or good that evaluation ought to serve or promote. So Schwant poses a question, to what purpose or in whose interest should evaluation practice be conducted. So with this in mind, the purpose of this paper is to revisit and clarify the implications for evaluation practice that aims for a moral good or end of social justice. So what do we mean by social justice? So this is a common definition of social justice that Bell proposes and um, 
we'll just communicate the end aim of this paper right up front, and that is with the italicized text and the bold text, what you see represented there are different conceptions of what justice is. So for example, in the first two lines, the goal of social justice is full and equal participation of all groups in society that is mutually shaped to meet their needs. Or social justice includes a vision of society in which the distribution of resources is equitable and all members are physically and psychologically safe and secure. And um, one of these elements focuses on justice as a distribution of resources, and the other one focuses on justice as um, recognition or a sense of rights that are innate in someone for being human. So to talk about this a bit more concretely, I want to think about a case of doing evaluation in Arupe College. So for the past um, 14 years, I have worked as a faculty member at Loyola University of Chicago, which is a private liberal arts university rooted in the Jesuit Catholic tradition. So phrases like social justice and transformative education are common explicit language in Loyola's institutional aims. And yet a tension exists between institutional mission and who has access to a loyal education due to the cost of tuition. In 2015, Loyola University founded Arupe College, which is a college within Loyola University Chicago. It's a private liberal arts two-year junior college, um, which is based on an innovative model. So Arupe enrolls students that aspire to a bachelor's degree and have limited financial resources for uh, college education. Approximately 300 Chicago area students attend Arupe are underrepresented students in higher education, such as students who may be undocumented, first generation, students of color, and so on. Um, students graduating from Arupe receive a debt free associate's degree with a concentration either in the arts and humanities, business, or social and behavioral assignment. Uh, sciences. It's a commuter campus with small class sizes and wraparound um, support. And I had the privilege of collaborating with colleagues at Arupe over a course of a few semesters um, when they were interested in partnering with graduate students in my evaluation course to carry out a series of evaluation projects on some of their programming. And so what I'm going to share with you is not tied to any specific evaluation project, but rather some observation and reflections across these multiple projects. So the graduate students made the observation that given the institutional mission, loyal administrators and Arupe staff members assume that Arupe was a just program, but as the evaluators working with diverse stakeholders, they rightly raised the question of, is Arupe College a just program, and utilize evidence in the evaluation to wrestle with that. So as an example of that, um, Arupe College is addressing injustices related to the distribution of economic resources and goods in higher education. Rube students are overwhelmingly grateful to have an opportunity to receive an associate's degree debt-free and frequently acknowledge that that wouldn't have even been possible to go to college without that possibility. But at the same time, Rube um, utilizes selective rather than an open admission process. And it's not a guarantee that students who attend a Rube graduate with a two-year associate's degree, although rates are better than other places nor that they finish a four-year degree. A limited number of students are only able to transfer into Loyola for their four-year degree, others go to other institutions. Um, we also encountered some students that were accepted into both Arupe and Loyola, um, but felt like it, Arupe was the only viable option given um, their financial circumstances. Um, so this example illustrates the complexity of 
thinking about justice as a distribution of resources around higher ed, as well as our respect for rights that students may have um, to respect for their person and um, respect for um, what they can offer and gain. So to get at these conceptions of justice, I turn to a philosopher, Nicholas Walter Storff, and a um, political theorist, Nancy Fraser Turner. And both have similar arguments in terms of justice. So Nicholas Walter Storff talks about justice as a right order in society, which an example of which is an appropriate distribution of resources and justice as natural rights for all human beings that just by being human we are afforded innate in us our certain rights similarly nancy fraser turner talks about justice as redistribution of resources and opportunities um, and also justice as recognition rooted in concerns about um, oppression and mar um, people who experience marginalization due to aspects of their identity and um, the importance of justice as recognizing um, people as whole selves and all elements of who they are with respect. And both of these scholars argue that we can't achieve justice unless we are using a both and approach and thinking about um, both approaches. So a question I ask myself is, do both of these concessions of evaluation undergird um, evaluation approaches that we use and what can we learn from that? So in the interest of time, I'll take two evaluation approaches. Um, one is um, democratic evaluation that's been put forward by the work of Ernest House, Jennifer Green, and others. So House and Howe are particularly known for deliberative democratic evaluation that includes three key elements, inclusion, dialogue, and deliberation. Um, their theory is rooted in John, John Grawl's theory of justice which Walter Dorf argues is ultimately a theory around um, distribution. Um, it's a distribution of, um, of rights. So there's um, rights involved, but it's not about those and rights being innate in people and deserving, um, but rights that are given to people. So in the process of evaluation, then as an evaluator in a democratic approach, um, I have the privilege of ensuring who has access and the right to participate in the evaluation and play a role in distributing that right in terms of giving, helping give voice to certain people at the table that may not have as much voice as others, for example, um, in the deliberation process and ensuring there's inclusion. So it seems that this approach might um, emphasize justice as distribution. Um, cultural responsive evaluation, um, hopefully everyone here is familiar with that, is um, rooted in the work of Stafford Hood, Karen Kirkhart, and others, um, but comes with the notion that too often outsiders in the community identify and conceptualize problems through their particular cultural lens, which results in a deficit rather than strengths-based perspective, and then design and evaluate programs based on these um, assumptions. Um, so culturally responsive evaluation instead involves stakeholders in those cultural um, contexts and gives recognition to um, particular cultural lenses that they bring. And so it seems much more attention to justice as recognition. Now, um, these philosophers and the work of Fell, 
are all rooted in Western thinking. And more recently, I've been engaging in dialogue with my colleague, Eleanor Titmull, who has focused on thinking about justice as healing rooted in the work of McCaslin. And it involves focusing on reconciling colonial harm in, on indigenous communities. And so here is another conception of justice that is important to think about. And so ultimately in this work, um, what we're trying to do is better conceptualize how we think about justice and ultimately how that informs our theory and makes sense of what we do in our evaluation practice. So here's some key references from our paper and look forward to questions and comments from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne and Eleanor, for your presentation. Um, we are going to open it up for thoughts, questions. Um, I want to just kind of give my initial thoughts as I was listening to the presentations and then others can also respond and if our presenters would like to provide their thoughts also. Um, I was struck by the question Karen posed to us being what could go wrong when we use an evaluation model or approach intended to promote equity inclusion but unintentionally supports white supremacy and settler, settler coloniality? Um, and that's a question, that's a loaded question where there's lots that we could talk about that. But as in thinking of that question, it also made me think about Leanne's presentation of not just our evaluation approaches, but as evaluators, if we are at the table when programs are being constructed, Right, And what are the models and frames programs use to construct their interventions and are there places within those frameworks that they're using that may also unintentionally support white supremacy and settler coloniality. Um, Leanne's presentation also made me think about, do we interrogate the language we use um, when we are using those words uh, to frame our work and what are the implications of those words when we are doing our work as evaluators? And then also coming back to Karen's idea of inclusion um, and really its roots being in these Western notions that lead a, can also lead to assimilation. Um, and so those are some things and this idea of harm being reciprocal. Um, and you know, what does, What's, what are those outcomes of that when we think of that? And so those are some initial thoughts that are hitting with me as we begin this discussion and dialogue. And so I now wanna open it up um, to our presenters to see if you all have additional thoughts or words that you would like to add. And then also to those who are attending today's session with questions or comments to get us going. Thank you very much, Sheree. I would just add, um, I, I loved Leanne and Eleanor's presentation, but I wanted to add, I don't know if you can, I don't know what this looks like from the other side, but Tuck and Yang's book, Toward What Justice, um, I just wanted to put that out there because it's not one that was in my references, but it's an amazing book. And it does a similar thing for justice that I was trying to do with the complicity argument. Um, which is to turn it around and examine its contradictions. And that activity, I, it reminds me of an Escher print. I don't know if you're familiar, but a graphic artist that did these prints with like staircases um, inverted and you would think that you were following it one way and you'd end up upside down in some other space entirely. And to me, that's exactly what this work feels like. And, and it's the process of being flipped around um, a vertigo almost um, of, of saying, wait a minute, I thought I was on the side of good or I thought I was on the side of innocence and then have it be flipped around and, 
and need to settle into the complicity of an alternate position and come to an alternate understanding. And I think we in the Korea community get perhaps just a tad too comfortable with our commonly shared values of justice and equity and inclusion. And then we don't see the edge and, and the other side of it. Like one of the most impactful pieces when I was, when uh, Nadia and I were putting together this presentation was this notion of inclusion as assimilation. This made me go, what? You know, but, it, but it's a real um, flip. It's a real alternate construction of the dynamics of what's actually happening. And so not only just the particular examples, but I just think that process is something we need to embrace and honor in this work. So that would be my, my observation. You're muted, Leanne. No, you're good, Leanne, right now. I'm good? OK. You. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. I think I'm having internet bandwidth issues, and so I partially froze and don't have full access to commands. Um, so. Um, thank you very much, Karen. That's a great resource. And as you were listening to a presentation, I know Eleanor and I were texting back and forth because um, one of the things that your presentation reminded us of is how much Jesuit education itself is rooted in the history of colonialism, right? And so even this process of setting up, you know, Arupe and what they're doing is, is in that whole history. Um, and so it really matters and the importance of, you know, revisiting that and having those conversations. I agree. Um, thank you so much, Karen and Leanne for pointing that out. I feel that one thing that has really um, stuck with me throughout this entire session and, and, and in the presentations uh, is what Karen said about, um, you know, um, Rec like recognition, differentiating recognition and inclusion and inclusion being assimilation. I think in my uh, studying of like indigenous evaluation and, and justice as an exploration of justice as healing, I think it is paramount that uh, to understand that the goal of healing is not to assimilate, particularly in indigenous communities, but rather to recognize uh, that indigenous people um, want to feel connected to their own culture and, and their own identities and, and not they do not desire to be healed. And I don't wanna speak for every indigenous person out there, but just for myself and, and from the work works that I've, I've read, um, there's not a desire to, to be healed and to assimilate to sort of like, um, you know, popular, uh, you know, scholarships and culture, but to be rather recognized as separate and, and just as important. Um, and so I think um, that that is sort of up and coming in our, our, our conversation is, is been, and has been repeated uh, this morning. So thank you for that. So we do have um, a question in the chat from Nikki. And so I wanna, in case you all have not seen it, I do wanna share it with you. Uh, the question being, how does colonialism and capitalism in academia and the field of evaluation continue the settler state and harm in contemporary practice? What are some policy systems and individual strategies you've used successfully in practice, not theoretically, that we could try? Hmm. Well, the, first a disclaimer. Uh, one thing about this journey, every time Kriya picks a new title, then it opens up a new journey for me. So I'm by no means an expert in settler coloniality, but it's been a journey to harvest some really interesting and I think provocative ideas. So the capitalism part of this question, 
total ignorance. I have like no background in economics, just a very thin sense of that whole system. So I wouldn't presume to, I, I couldn't make intelligent responses about that. But I think, and I'm a theoretician, so I don't have like good practice examples such as um, my colleague Joan LaFrance can use um, and gave in our indigenous workshop yesterday where I was just, a, I was the sidekick. Um, but I think in part, it's the zoom out that's important. I guess I would say that. And, and although it's a, it's a theoretical position, I guess, I think it's also, that's where the praxis piece, I think that connection of theory and practice is important because like if you take, like within CRE, um, Jill Chenard and her colleague um, Stickler Halson did a wonderful analysis of power in CRE, but they were looking within um, individual published um, research examples. So case examples taken from public research, which is fine. It was a, a lovely piece of work, not a thing wrong with it, but the settler coloniality and white supremacy pieces to me call us to zoom out and like look at, I couldn't help but think like, but what's the bigger picture within which they're carefully delineated um, summary table of dimensions of power in CRE sits within this larger system. So to me, the practice piece I would say is this notion of zooming in and remembering to zoom back out to look at these broader systems, including, as I tried to illustrate, including recognizing our ignorance of certain parts of the system and doing our homework in, in new areas so that we're not oblivious to other dimensions. Um, and I, I think that's a challenge for evaluation because I still believe, as Scriven would say, it's a transdiscipline, so it's very big. And, um, and it's challenging to grapple with all of the dynamics, I think. I would say it's a great question, Nikki, and something I ask. I don't think I have answers. I wish I did. Um, I feel like it's a lifelong struggle. Um, the only thing that comes to mind are um, sort of those movements you make in interactions with stakeholders in the process of doing the evaluation. So some examples I'm thinking about in the Arupe project are um, early on when I started, you know, the staff and faculty wanted me to only exclusively work with them in the evaluation. And um, it took a lot of pull and persuasion to say, no, your students need to be a part of this process. And yet they still needed to have their finger in how students were involved, right? So we were constantly pushing and negotiating around that. Um, and then ultimately in full disclosure, I am no longer working with them with my class to do evaluation. And part of that is it came to a point of you know, we're looking for data to demonstrate the value of what we're doing. We appreciate you asking these other questions, right? But we don't want to engage in that right now. Wow. And I had to make a choice that if they're choosing not to engage in that right now, I am not going to support <laughs> in other ways. Was that the right choice? I. I don't know, right? That's the ultimate struggle. Is it better to be at the table? Um, but I didn't wanna become complicit, right? Used in ways that um, we didn't see a value. Um, so yes, I, I, I take any and all strategies people, people have. Thank you. So we have a raised hand um, by David. Um, and then Pippin, I see your comment. And after David, if you want to expound a little bit more in the chat, from the chat. 
Thanks, Sheree. Hi, everyone. I'm David Sewell with Sewell and Associates International. I'll be speaking tomorrow about my work on the development of culturally specific assessments. I spent the last five years working within indigenous environments to develop assessments that are designed and developed from within that worldview. And in being in this space really allows one to see the gaps that exist between a culturally specific perspective and a culturally responsive um, perspective. And I think one of the, the key points uh, of, of difference is that it's really important to acknowledge the worldview within which we're functioning. There is an unstated worldview that the dominant structures um, are allowed. <laughs> they, it, it is so predominant that we don't even have to mention, we don't even have to say it, we just exist in it. And we don't ever acknowledge that it's there in our work. So for example, consider the term community-based participatory research. Some of us here might just call that research. So who are the people that need to be told that it should be community-based? Who are the people that need to be told that it should be participatory? You know, it's really important to thoroughly vet our ter terms like inclusion and really understand which space we're operating from when we use those terms. When we sign the, inclus the inclusion uh, user agreement, <laughs> you know, wh which space are we functioning within? And just like we need to thoroughly vet our terms, we also have to thoroughly vet the ideas that ground our discipline. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting parallel, I think. CBPR has quite a bit in common, that community-based participatory research, um, coming out of community psychology more than, say, education, which is the grounding of CRE. So both the zoom out captures those different disciplinary roots, as well as, I think, some of the, um, the challenges they share power relationships, for example, when you get to that piece about participation, you know, uh, whose agenda is driving the participation and who, what are the costs and benefits for the participants and how does that whole power dynamic playing out? Um, culturally specific um, work, unlike culturally responsive, is there a gap? I don't know that I would have characterized it as a gap, but they certainly are distinctly, they can be distinctly different because I see culturally responsive as, as more of, as bigger, I guess. And then the zoom in becomes the culturally specific saying, no, you're not just adapting a method or working from a majority construct you're starting from, like Joan and Richard did, and in a, a tribal analysis of a particular um, situation and, and building the questions from there and most importantly, building the methods from there um, so that you're not just adapting, you're creating from scratch something wholly new. So I think that that is a useful distinction. Thank you, David. Um, Pippin, would you like to share more of your thoughts um, based upon what you've put in the chat? Sure. Uh, I was just, I wanted to ask, um, especially Leanne, uh, Dr. Kellerman, if I pronounced that right. Leanne is good. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about the difference and maybe the distinction in the concepts and if you had looked at how justice as distribution or recognition, um, how looking at the angle of justice as impact provides other insight, or if you've looked at that or found that helpful in your work. I'm thinking specifically about, uh, I work with organizations trying to do multicultural 
work trying to do relationship building to dismantle systems of oppression. It's really long and slow work, obviously. Uh, but often when they engage in a relationship with a culture, a group that has a culture that's different than a sort of dominant culture, especially dominant culture in that group, they make all kinds of projections about what the outcomes and what the goals are and what uh, progress would look like. And they have conceptions of justice. They really want to work for justice. But their concepts of justice are not the concepts of justice of the people that they're building relationships with. And so trying to, sh I find it, I'm trying to, work on the justice as impact and what the other person what all groups want in terms of justice. So I didn't know if you had thought of that concept. Yeah, I mean, I think impact is very much an evaluation concept. So when I go to readings of philosophers and these political theorists, they're not really talking about justice as an impact because I think, you know, impacts itself can have different moral ends or goods, right? Um, they can be um, a variety of things. Um, so I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. I, I should, sorry, I should probably clarify. I mean more like justice as impact on agency or justice as enhancing capabilities. So that comes uh, from okay. Sen Nussbaum's work on human capability. Yeah. So a sense of agency would be very much rooted in this idea of justice and rights and recognition, that agency is one of these innate <laughs> human qualities that ought to be respected. Everyone has and possesses. It. It's nothing you're given, <laughs> you, you have it. Um, and the way we interact in the world in a just way is to recognize that in each other. Um, would sort of, I think, where it would fall. Um, and so if it's about, you know, working with stakeholders around them having opportunities to exercise agency and what they see as the impact and what's important in matter, is that the work at hand? Yeah. That's yeah. Really, it, instead mm -hmm. of imposing their own uh, judgment about what the outcome of that relationship ought to be. Right, right. They, they have a very deeply colonial mindset of, well, we should be in a relationship that leads to something good because we're good. I mean, that's right. a common struggle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks, I'm just uh, curious to look into this, some of these concepts more, so I appreciate it. I'm wondering, I don't wanna put you on the spot, Karen, but having not read the text you mentioned about Tuck and Yang, do they have any perspectives that would enlighten this? It's on my reading list now. It complicates it. It's an anthology of different examples. Um, okay. And so it's it's an amazing book. You can see mine's all like marked up with flu, uh, <laughs> tape flags and such. Um, but it's more the point of looking at the dynamics and contradictions within the construct of justice. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's, that's the generalizable piece so that we can take it, for example, to looking at the dynamics and contradictions within culturally responsive evaluation or culturally specific evaluation. That, and the, the importance of considering the possibility that we start out understanding we're going here, but it flips and we end up over, over someplace else and, and specifically the risk of, of doing harm when we intended to be someplace very different from that. And I think just that caution, and it, it relates, although cultural humility is not one of my favorite constructs, but I think it does relate to humility for sure, to not, to being always in the back of your mind concerned that this might not be the path. And I think, I mean, I'm really struck by the courage of your choice to just step back and say, no, um, the complicity is so clear to me and the bias that is being built into this system is so clear that I can no longer participate. And I think um, that, that both that's personally and professionally courageous and evaluators probably don't do enough of that. Right. Um, 
And I and will say I have the privilege of doing that being an academic, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and the privilege of the academy, right. Easy for me to say, um, right. but my colleague is earning a living by doing evaluation. Exactly. And so for her, the contingencies would be very different right. if she right. stepped back. Right. Um, so, but then again, that, and I suppose that relates back to the opening question on capitalism about which I, I pled ignorance in terms of really being able to wrap my head around how that system is behind and driving some of these other ideas. Other questions or comments um, from attendees? Um, yeah, Nikki, this, yeah. Go ahead on. I was Sorry. just scro scrolling through chat and noticed that Nikki had cited um, Vine Deloria Jr.'s God is Red. Yeah, that whole Vine Deloria reader uh, of his uh, collective works is a really good resource also. Um, and, and that same quote, uh, same chat comment mentions uh, the roots of trauma and uh, I can't, I can't overstate how, and I'm not, I don't have a good solid background in history that's not the white version of history, but how traumatic it was to read that Hickson book and just, I can't describe it well, or certainly in a sophisticated way, but just the the visceral impact of trauma gave me a different level of understanding of other types of trauma that I knew intellectually existed, but I don't know how to describe it. That the level of violence was so vivid and clear that it, it just led to a different level of understanding. I guess I'll leave it there. But that trauma and violence piece is often embedded in, I think, so much of the circumstances we're interrogating as culturally responsive researchers. And I guess I hadn't fully come to grips with all of the self-processing. I need Hazel to step in and and help me process the, a, a deeper appreciation of the brutality, the brutality, both historically and current day, that, um, again, my experience is domestic, so, but that this country is grappling with is stunning. Hey, this is Nikki, and I'm sorry, I can't turn my camera on. I'm in the woods at my house. I would just like, I really like to commend the um, panelists with the level of um, honesty and humility, you know, by saying, uh, I don't know, or I'm still sort of processing it. Th those are really important things. And sitting with that uncomfortableness, being comfortable yeah. with being comfortable with being uncomfortable is part of this process for all of us. And um, today is where Orange Jay so residential and boarding school survivors and victims, I think it's very relevant given, and Karen, you're right, it is so ugly. And it's, it's when you hear it firsthand from boarding school and residential school survivors, which my family also was, or about the deaths, it's part of a bigger system. And that's why I was asking about sy systems and capitalization. And it's, um, it, you know, it keeps, it's like this cog that we're all stuck in. And it's these kinds of discussions that we're having today out loud in the open. You know, sometimes you could, I can only read a page or two at a time, or if I'm sitting with a family or if I'm doing a, a research or evaluation study, I literally have to take time off so I can process all that because that gets on your spirit as well as your you know, your mind and your work. And so I really appreciate the discussions today. And, and, you know, Karen is living proof that, you know, you are never too old to learn. 
And we all can work on things that help us become wise in our walk. None of us are perfect. And the important part is that we're trying to journey through this together. So I really appreciate today and some of the, um, the honest discussion that's going here on here because I don't see it happening in a lot of other contexts for the most part. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Nikki. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions posed in the chat um, goes to Leanne, kind of this idea that you brought up about when evaluators decline work based on ethical principles. And the question is, what is the risk of a less conscientious evaluator coming along and causing more harm? Um, that is the risk. In this case, I knew there was not another. So <laughs> because I was doing it with a class for free. So I didn't have to weigh that um, at the time. Um, there was another project that I had a similar circumstance, um, but then the evaluator ended up being someone I knew, but they didn't know that we actually worked together. <laughs> so they found another like-minded person and didn't even realize it. So I haven't experienced yet when I turned down a project that that is the case, but I think it is important um, to consider. And that's where, it, is it better to be at the table or not? And the footnote to that, I would think would be, is it better to let program X go unevaluated? Right. Than to evaluate it a certain way, because you, there was no one else knocking at the door to do an alternate evaluation. But I presume from your presentation, it just got left alone. Right. And I think that is dangerous too, right? Or it's just done internally, mm -hmm. right? Without alternative perspectives. Mm -hmm. Other questions or thoughts? Um, from participants. And while we have a moment of silence here, I'll just say I will upload in WOVA our presentation because I realized in the recording the final slides with the references and um, Eleanor's slide didn't come through and then people will have that um, for reference. I would do it right now, but like I said, I because of bandwidth, I'm getting freezing. <laughs> Well, we knew we had extra time for this session because there was a, a third paper that dropped out. So um, we, we don't need to feel obliged to fill the whole time um, if you'd rather go get coffee before the next session or something like that. We do have another question that's come oh, in. Um, okay. And, and so a question is, are there current questions or challenges um, you all are struggling with as we think about, you know, CRE, as we think about um, really these issues of interrogation and conceptualization, kind of what are the current challenges and struggles you are experiencing? Hmm. Well, just wrapping my head around all of the new ideas for this presentation is a challenge. I think this combined with my collaborations with Joan LaFrance on evaluation influence have me thinking a lot about place and the importance of, of place in every sense of the word, geographic, personal space, but the importance of location, cultural location, identity, um, I think, and, and the geographic piece, um, like I found a lot of the settler coloniality um, readings in geography, who knew? I did not, probably, obviously geographers did, but I mean, there's just so many interesting threads to follow. And for me, given the current moment and, and times, the environmental justice issue for me is what is 
keeps me awake at night, uh, frankly. I mean, um, that, that, and I connect it to the importance of place in evaluation, which I think we've not yet interrogated as much as it deserves. I'm lobbying for that to be a future theme of, of um, a CREA conference, because I think that's a really, it could go in so many different directions, but place connected to environment, connected to evaluation, connected to justice, those are the things that I'm interested in pursuing. Uh, it's too early to say I'm even struggling with them yet, because but that I see as the next journey on the horizon. Um, I've really appreciated my conversations with Eleanor around justice as healing. And I think that's that's where I'm at. I know for many of you that have worked in indigenous communities doing evaluation, I'm sure this isn't a new way of thinking um, for you, like healing and reconciliation and many other areas of my life has always been important. But I think I've never thought about that when I'm wearing that evaluator hat of, of what that means and what that looks like. Um, and so, yeah, just, um, yeah, being open to really thinking about that. And just to piggyback on that, um, I think I've talked to Leanne a lot about uh, the emotional labor of like being in this profession and, and being a person of color and being young. <laughs> um, I am in, I'm still in grad school. I'm like a PhD candidate. And so, and working with Leanne, um, in projects that do have clients where there's a lot of tension and we have to sort of dissect um, this emotional labor and um, making sure that like other stakeholders that we are with um, whom um, feel that this work is really emotionally laborious, um, speaking for them, not necessarily speaking for them, but um, recognizing the labor uh, just, just because other people can't um, stay at the moment. Um, so I think that's what I'm, I'm struggling with as a young, um, you know, new evaluator learning and learning the practice, but also learning uh, like theories um, and, and scholarly work around that. Um, I just also want to thank Karen for pointing out like environmental justice. I think um, that's really un like it's not talked about a lot um, in these circles. And, and for me as uh, Pacific Islander uh, and Palau and having grown up in the islands, we talk a lot about the impacts of uh, capitalism and, and colonialism and imperialism that are still very real today um, on just our environment and like the future of our, our lives and our, our homes because of the impacts that uh, those three things um, have had on, on just the, the environment, which, environment which we're very dependent on and how on the global scale, um, we are the ones that are like in the front lines of fighting for environmental justice where people, uh, bigger countries, uh, colonial, like colonist countries, colonizer countries are, are not doing enough, um, at least in my opinion, um, to sort of recognize that they play a huge role in, in how uh, our homes are, are diminishing uh, really fast. And so just thank, want, want to thank you for pointing that out. Hey, this is Nikki. I had a, another resource that I put in there and I'll, I'll have to figure out when I have better internet. Um, Kate McKig did a, a truth, healing and reconciliation panel, keynote panel with Nan Wapahania, myself and Larry Bremner for the Canadian Eval Society, I want to say in 20, 2018. Um, and she, as the only non-BIPOC person, non-Indigenous person on the panel, really had a wonderful paper and everything in the Canadian journal is free. Um, that's, a, that's a systemic way um, to have, right, uh, to, to deal with a white settler, you know, the settler state making money off stolen land is not have a paywall between um, articles and, uh, you know, the people who need to use them. Anyways, Kate is doing great work in this area as is Andre Lisa Belzer and really the Canadian Evaluation Society in general on um, how to develop as a white ally, a white friend, a white relative, whatever is the word of choice. And so when you speak about emotional 
uh, you know, in practical labor of sort of doing that. That's a position I wrote about in a blog, very short, um, but uh, for AEA, but um, it's a way that kind of rings light to who can uh, folks who are on this journey turn to. Because one of the things that comes up for me is sort of that this labor aspect of like we we didn't I didn't create the problem, you know we're still dealing with it, you know, and sort of it add, it sort of compounds and it's hard because we there are so few for Indigenous people so few of us, and we're asked to do so much, you know, and to help unpack some of this stuff, it you know is part of the responsibility, but it cannot be overwhelming. And so self-care is something Hazel Simonette talks about. And so just urging everyone to do that, including, you know, non-BIPOC, because it, it's a it's a lot to process, you know, and, you know, let alone change, live and, and be differently. But that's part of transformation, I guess, you know. Thank you, Nikki. And Nikki, did you say 2018? You believe? Yes, and I'll see if I can, I'm outside of my house now to see if I can find one more bar and add the link in, or I can put it in Wova chat if I can figure that out. Thank you. And the senior author she mentioned is Kate McKegg. It's M-C-K-E-G-G. -G. I couldn't hear that clearly, but I heard enough to, to remember who it was. All right, any final closing comments or questions? If not, then I wanna thank you everyone uh, for attending our session today. Uh, we greatly appreciate all of the wonderful thoughts, insights, um, and the continued dialogues that must go on around the topics presented today. A big thank you to Alicia for serving as our moderator um, and working technology behind the scenes. And then also a big thank you to our presenters um, for spurring thoughtful discussion with us today. And so we appreciate everyone uh, taking time out to join us. And hopefully you'll enjoy this break before um, our keynote at lunch. And that I believe will be a very good discussion also. So thank you everyone.